Hey, everybody, welcome to Event Speak with me, Big John, CEO of Beyond Experiential. We're an interview show, and if you haven't checked us out, you should. And if you have, thanks for coming by. You know then, we basically talk with folks uh, from all aspects of the entire inclusive event industry ecosystem. We've had some fascinating guests and great conversations where, you know, we're just trying to give everybody that lives in the event business a common place to come and create dialogue as we get through these difficult times that we call COVID life here in America. And today's guest is no exception to the rule of someone that I would say is probably one of the funniest people that I've ever had the pleasure of spending time with. Um, he has a unique background as he comes from the event industry as a creative, but is now a big shot Hollywood screenwriter and actor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Event Speak Forum, Mr. Steve Mallory. Steve, welcome to Event Speak. Hi, I feel like I should make an entrance. Like I should just become a hi. How are you? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, how you doing, man? I am very good. How are you, John? Oh, you know what? I'm doing much better, except for the fact that I'm once again focused on how much hair you have and yeah. how much hair I do not have. <laughs> You know what? If you just if you just sit at home and watch old baseball games and eat too much like homemade bread, hair will grow. That's my recommendation. It seems is, to work. Is that your recommendation? Is yeah, uh, homemade bread and old baseball games? Old baseball games. Yeah, I'm recommending like the 1996 World Series, something like that. That will really <laughs> kick it over. And you know, and I, I, I do, I follow your, uh, your socials and I, and I see the array of, uh, it seems baking and, uh, cooking yeah. is, is high on the, uh, on the, in the Mallory household priority list these days. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do and it has reached compulsive behavior now. <laughs> and my, my poor family, they're like, we're, we're not going to die of COVID. We're going to die of gout. <laughs> we're going to die of gout. There's no way we make it out of here. With, with like, we're going to need dialysis after this because it's every meal is just as sumptuous and delicious as possible. It's, it's terrible. It's terribly impressive. Now, I mean, I'm clearly a foodie. Uh, yeah. I, I love to, I mean, we've, we've toured together back in the day and, um, you know, I, I love to cook at home and I do, but man, like the, some of the stuff I've seen you make and we're, we're adding things like, like sage butter and fancy yeah. things like this. I'm like, woo, wow. My, my, my whole thing here is now that time doesn't mean anything, it means nothing. I'm looking for recipes that are incredibly complex and hopefully take more than a couple of days. So if there's a way I have to start like, um, brining a meat three days and then have to smoke it for a day so that I have like one piece of it that might go in something else that takes, that's my thing. So bread can take two to everything. I just want things to take forever. So, so that while I'm sitting and doing nothing, I can go, actually I'm proofing bread right now. So I am doing something. It's just an excuse for me to feel like I'm doing something when I'm doing nothing. And have deliciousness to eat all the time it, you know it, but it has reached a point where i'm we're delivering more bread like i i'm baking like three loaves of bread a day and then i'm calling people and it's like does anybody need bread because i'm bringing you a loaf of bread where were you like a month ago right when, <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. I, um, I work in Hollywood. Do you know a few people actually eat gluten? There's like two people. They're getting all the bread. I was just going to say, like, you're, you're a Hollywood guy now. Like, I mean, who the hell's going to eat bread? I mean, I, I actually, uh, when I first ran across your, uh, your bread videos on, uh, and pictures on, on your, uh, your socials, I dug out my, uh, my Cuisinart. I got a, a bread maker. I'm not all oh, fancy yeah. like you are, but I've, I've been starting to make my own bread, you know, like, well, the bread machine does most of the work, but I still put all the stuff in it and I hit the button. And yeah. Away it it's goes. still something. It's still something. <laughs> now we're going to talk, you know, something I, I love to do on, on the show is we, we love to do exactly that is, is talk about the things that we're, that we're, we're spending our time doing, but uh, we're going to back it up a little bit here just because I mentioned at the, uh, when I first came in that, um, you know, you, you are now, um, you're a screenwriter, you're, you're an actor, uh, you, you've done well for yourself in that sense, but you also, uh, the way we know each other, you're, uh, you're a creative at a, at a big agency at one point. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and for a long time. Yeah, and, and, and I remember um, when we met, you were 
you would you would be working on on various things you know uh, treatments or uh, stuff you were writing uh, what I'm kind of curious about Steve is uh, you know was that something that you always aspired to do you know when you were working in the event industry as a creative were you still were you aspiring to become uh, a screenwriter then um, was it something that sort of landed in your lap or can you walk me through a little bit how that sort of all came into fruition for you yeah absolutely yeah I you know, I, I think I always, I always knew I wanted to do something creative, no matter what. I mean, from the time I was, you know, in my 20s. And, you know, where I was brought up and how I was brought up, it's like, well, you can't, no one actually works in Hollywood. That's not an actual job. So you're gonna have to find a thing that's a job that's creative to do. And it's one of the reasons why I went into uh, marketing, public relations, creative directing, and events because it gave me that kind of creative fix that I, that I was looking for. And I always knew it wasn't exactly right, but it, it sure flipped a lot of the switches. You know, back in the early 2000s, I had my own small little marketing firm that did a lot of events. Like I, I, I think that I won best booth at CES in 2002 for a branch of Ericsson uh, they had a, they had a product called cyber genie. And for two years in a row, I like created every single piece of a CES booth for them, including the presentation that I would do. So I would write myself scripts and associating videos. And I would produce those and I would make the presentations for them. So even back then I was really just using events as an opportunity to kind of get up and do something, you know, do some sort of presentation, some sort of writing, some sort of everything. And it's a lot of the people I know in that business have the chops to kind of move into Hollywood. It's just opportunity. And I, I lucked out. I, I found a great opportunity to do it. So would you say then, you know, in a sense, it was a bit serendipitous. I mean, um, you, you know, you've done a bunch of uh, a big films now and a lot of work with Melissa McCartney and other yeah, yeah. Uh, big, big Hollywood names. Um, now I would think that, as you were saying, you know, there's as someone that's worked in experiential a long time and you see what you see what the creative types come up with and what they do. There's some really incredibly talented people there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're aware, uh, David, David Bird, little Dicky, uh, worked at an ad agency in San Francisco when he launched his career and openly talks about how that experience helped him tremendously as he got a crash course in sort of like how movies and commercials were made. Yeah. Um, once you made the jump, once you officially left the day job and you were now officially, you know, writing in Hollywood full time, did you notice a similar transition? Would you say that the event industry kind of helped ramp you up to be prepared for what was coming next or once the floodgates open was it a whole different experience for you uh, floodgates i love that there might be floodgates someday <laughs> uh, well I'll, I'll say this you know i worked for almost uh, nine years nine years plus for uh edelman public relations one of the largest public relations companies in the world and i believe at the end my title was uh, director of ideation that was my title. What a, what, what a fake title. I mean, it's a perfect <laughs> fake title. It doesn't mean anything. Um, As but, ideas. Yes, it was all ideas. I'm just coming up with ideas. I'm going to teach. I'm not going to, I'm going to teach you how to come up with an idea. So I don't have to come up with the idea. So my job is, uh, well, they didn't figure it out. So uh, I'm going to, I'll take it to our lunch. Um, <laughs> but what I will say, honestly, is working for agencies and working in the industry gave me a, a type of rigor and process that I don't think many people in Hollywood really ascribe to. You know, it takes a lot of, of planning and it takes a lot of, we're going to do all of this right now because in, in a month from now, we're not gonna be able to do it. You know, like, it, you know, that, that, that really hardcore zero day planning that it requires when you start applying that to working in Hollywood and writing screenplays and producing movies and TV shows, uh, you know, I get in, in Hollywood, I get a lot of, wow, you turn a lot of stuff around really fast. Or I wasn't expecting this level of presentation when you bring in a script to pitch. And it's like, yeah, this is like half of what I used to do when I used to work <laughs> in the biz. You know? I was going to say. 
it, it, it literally feels like I always have an advantage when I am when I have to go do something or present something or come up with ideas because listen experiential is a grind you have you're always on your toes and you're always working you're trying to think 10 steps ahead in Hollywood I think most people are thinking maybe two steps ahead so if you can think five steps ahead you're twice as good as them but still half as good as the experiential I can't do math I'm a writer but something like that (laughs) No, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. So uh, in short, yes, it, it probably really, really did benefit you it, in that it way. It really because... did. It really did. I, I, feel, I feel more prepared for when I first really started coming into this. And by the way, when I first started coming into this, you know, the little bit of backstory is that I was in the Groundlings, the theater in Los Angeles where sketch comedy and improv comedy, that sort of thing, with a lot of people like Melissa McCarthy and her husband, Ben, and Kristen Wiig and Will Ferrell and all these people, right? So I always knew I, I, I like to do that, but I was working a corporate gig, you know, working for a big thing. When I wrote, I co-wrote the movie The Boss with Melissa. And we made the movie The Boss in Atlanta and Chicago. I was still working at Edelman and I asked for time off. I asked for, for three months unpaid so that I could go produce and write on my own movie. And they gave it to me. So I went and was Hollywood guy, someone bringing me a coffee, you know, uh, and having my own chair. And then I came back to work. I went, I went back to the office, went right back to where I was. Depression was heavy. It was a lot. I was going to say, what was, what was that like? You go from, was, you go from that yeah. back to the office. What, what, what it was, was it? it was something else. It was something else. Uh, because, it was so, it was so different, you know. Uh, both transitions were different, but I was someone who was like, no, 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 Hollywood's still a pipe dream. Sure, I just I made a movie for Universal, but it's still a pipe dream. And you always hear those things about someone like, now I'm in Hollywood, I'm gonna go buy a, a yacht that flies, and I'm done. <laughs> and it's like I, I'm not that kind of person. I'm just not built like that. So, uh, you know, when you say floodgates, it was like I the 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 gates bare. I wouldn't even let the gates barely open. Like I I had to literally. I was a co-producer of Ben uh, of Melissa's second movie, Life of the Party, and I remember going to my boss and like, hey, wondering if I could get another three months off. And they're like, it's probably time to go. You should probably go. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was just like committing to doing this and it's been great it's been great it's only been like four years really would you would you say it was a scary leap for you i mean being you know your oh husband God. you're a father like you know like you of course I'm, I'm sure like you know those 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 gigs were they do well for you but now you're leaving you're leaving the uh the security of the corporate yeah. job that you've worked all this time and you're officially kind of like jumping off the deep end jumping off yeah. into the deep end if you will that had to be a scary experience, but exhilarating at the same time. You know, I think everybody has that experience at some point in their life where they are, you're Tarzan. Everybody's Tarzan and you're swinging on a vine and then you have to grab another vine and release the other vine. And honestly, I was holding both vines. I was, I, I was like, I can't. I can't. I'm just going to hang here until this tree falls down. That I mean, that was me because exactly right. I was terrified of, you know, what could be in that, you know, there's the gilded cage of like, boy, every, every two weeks, I, I know exactly how much is going in my bank account versus, hey, you could, you, you're, no one might buy this next one. And then you're, you're, you know, up a creek. Uh, so yeah, it, it was really, really tough. And probably for even a year afterwards, well, I, my wife still knows, like, if I go do a project, you know, I go to Atlanta or someplace to go shoot, I come back and literally on the, on the flight back, she goes, uh, when are we scheduling your, your really deep, depressive moodiness? I'm like, I think <laughs> Wednesday? Okay, is Wednesday good for you? That I... It's feeling like Thursday, maybe? <laughs> yeah, let's say late Wednesday evening into Thursday, I'll become prickly and a jerk. <laughs> and uh, uh, sleepy, like all that, because it's still th- this kind of cyclical nature of the business is so different than you know your nine to five. Hurry, go make some bread. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> what, 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 food poisoning everybody. <laughs> now you know on a 
on a on a on a, a little more of a somber note, I mean, of course, right now, uh, unprecedented times across the board for every industry. Um, but the event industry, Hollywood in particular, you know, we're we're at a complete standstill yeah. overall right now. Um, now, as someone that's you know a, a comedy writer uh, and a, a, a funny guy, like that's of your nature. Um, looking looking at you know as things are slowly starting to come back um how do you see humor playing in the role playing a role into the recovery of the overall industry um how do you see it sort of uh starting to to come back if you will um do you do you think it's going to be a thing where uh like like everything else you know we're, we're seeing a very slow peel back and you know there's going to be some businesses that open and then others that don't and so on and so forth looking at um looking at hollywood looking at uh films and tv do you feel it will be a similar situation well i mean the whole movie going experience is is such a huge question mark i mean it really is and so Films, the the film going thing is, I mean, I sure as heck don't know, but I know a lot of people are trying to figure it out. Universal getting in trouble for releasing trolls online and then theaters don't want to play. You know, it's it, there's a whole bunch of, of machinations going on. But, but, God bless the internet. Could you imagine doing this without the internet, by the way? I, I don't think uh, uh, people Wait. aren't, Wait, like, <laughs> and you and I aren't even tired doing this right now. Like this, we're, we're at such an amazing time that we have the technology to be able to a have these wonderful conversations. And I get I get to see the color of your sheets, which wonderful. Uh, They're Egyptian, actually. Oh, I wouldn't doubt. They look four hundred counts in here, but I don't want to know. My um, my my kitty twins, as you can see, are behind me enjoying them right now. <laughs> the cat's also Egyptian. Interesting. <laughs> Um, but you know, one of the, one of the great things about this terrific internet world and this is streaming, you know, that there's all of these areas right now where people are enjoying online content, but you know, a lot of it, a lot of it. And frankly, something I know for sure is that a lot of it is comedy. A lot of people are revisiting old sitcoms. Like, you know, the office community has just destroyed it since they released it on Netflix. My daughter is going through Parks and Rec, Rec right now at 13. Like, she's watching five episodes a day. People people aren't watching kind of, uh, you know, documentaries about atrocities right now. People want their spirits lifted, and they want to be transported. And it reminds me a lot of what happened after the Great Depression, you know, that the big, the movie that won the Academy Award out of uh, out of the Depression was Grand Hotel, which was all about dandies having uh, you know misunderstandings in this beautiful hotel where they're all wearing tuxes. People want to see that when they didn't have you know food, they didn't have housing, they wanted to see luxury. You know, you saw Fred Astaire in Ginger Rogers dancing in top hat, where it's just everyone's in tuxes and elegant. You know, people want this fanciful escapism. And I think that comedy does that really, really well. And not only that, comedy does it really well for what the small groups that we can be in, comedy's really effective. Comedy's better when you're with somebody you love and somebody you know in the room with you. So I, I have high hopes for comedy continuing in all the different places. And I, you know, I'm hooray for streaming. I, I'm, I consider myself the stream king right now. I have like, <laughs> three different platforms all with product projects on them so it's very exciting that is very exciting and i think you hit the nail on the head when you said um and and if anybody that's been watching uh the show they know that i've been talking about this a lot that um because of technology we're so fortunate that well yes what we're going through is is has been so devastating for so many people and by no means am i trying to make light of that but it's it shows some silver linings like anything else, you know, there's perspective in life is, is, is really largely dictates our reality. Um, and we're so fortunate that we can be so connected. Um, I know that me personally, just through, uh, through my business to my family and friends, I probably have seen many more of them than I have even 
you know, BC before Corona, because we're all on Zoom and we're all talking to each other. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're so much more connected uh, than we were even before, even though this technology was still there. So it kind of called attention to the fact that we need to continue that interaction. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, I think, can anyone honestly say they don't enjoy a good laugh and that they don't, they don't love sharing that with, with people they, they love and they care about their friends and their family. Um, now let's talk about some projects that you're working on now, because you did, you did mention, we're talking about streaming and, and how yeah. that is playing obviously. And not only just because of, uh, of COVID, but you know, just in the general direction of the industry where it's going, uh, you have a new show called flipped on, um, Quibi, correct? Quibi, uh, yeah, yeah. It's the new video platform uh, for the for mobile that uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg brought to us. Tell me about Flipped, Steve, and a little bit about what that's like. Uh, so Flipped is stars Will Forte uh, and Caitlin Olson from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, we started this. My, me and my uh, writing partner and producing partner had an idea, and actually went around to most of the studios, like, "Hey, we have this idea." about a couple um, that are like a lot of couples where they're so codependent on each other and they so co-enable that even though they're probably talentless, they are certain that they're both geniuses because they just live in that kind of echo chamber of themselves. And in their space, they're certain that they are interior design brilliant because they watch all the shows on, on you know, the HGTV kind of show. So they watch it like a lot of people do and do the hate watching of like, man, I could do that in my, in my sleep. I could, I, you know what? I, I picked that color. My color would be so much better. They just do that. And they're kind of at a low point in their life. And the network that they're watching the show on has a contest to be the next super couple. You know how they do that? Like be the next home renovation TV, whatever it is. Yeah, And so yeah. they spend every dime they have to buy a crappy little house out in the middle of the desert to renovate so that they'll be on TV because it's, it's a foregone conclusion that their genius will be seen once they make this video. So they drive out to this desert, start doing the reno on just like a 700 foot piece of garbage. And the second they tear down what little drywall there is, they see the walls are filled with uh, cellophane wrap bundles of hundreds. And they, they uh, question themselves, like, what should we be doing? You know, they, they make a big point of, like, we need to be responsible. We need to do the right thing. We need to think this through. And then you cut to them absolutely using all of that money to renovate that house. All the money they find. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's a lot of fun. It's so it's really funny. Great. And uh, it's it was so great to let the let Will and Caitlin play these, you know, over the top, overly confident, but completely unearned kind of people. It was a blast. We also have uh, Andy Garcia and Ava Longoria and Arturo Castro in it. It's it's a really terrific show. Wow, and that's incredible, man! It, watch it. There's still a free trial on for Quibi right now, uh, and you know, Quibi Quibi's an interesting thing because they they also kind of really got swept up in the, in the, in what the detriment of this, you know, the, the, our plague, I'm calling it the plague, the plague, our modern day plague did because their whole concept was, you know, people in line on the phone or their bus, you know, Oh, I'm, I, I you know, I'm in line at the bank. I'm going to watch a seven minute episode of a show and I can watch another seven minute. Every episode is between seven and 10 minutes, really short, little quick content. Well, the second everyone, and, and only your phone, only your tablet. There's no TV option. There's no computer option. And so literally they launched in the middle of a thing where everyone's just sitting in front of TVs and computers. Nobody's, you know, I'm using my phone occasionally to text, but I'm certainly not going to watch that. And I'm not in line for anything. And I don't need to waste time. I have too much time. I have an abundance of time. So poor Quibi kind of got caught in the crosshairs of this. And Jeffrey Katzenberg even said recently that, you know, it was a mistake to launch during this time. We should have held the launch. Um, and not only that, they're like all good businesses pivoting. And within the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to cast from your phone, to your TV to watch the show. That would have been my next question. Then I think it seems like the obvious, I mean, that's just a, again, how do you, you, you can't really put pandemic into your planning as, no. as you're about to roll out this new show or what you would think in 
again, BC before Corona, you would think that a platform that is completely dedicated to mobile is just going to be on fire, you know, yeah. and you're, I mean, I could say personally, there's, I find myself when I'm, when it's not uh, current times, when I'm just looking to get little bits and blasts of, of entertainment, because that's literally all I have the time for is that, you know, a few minutes at a time. That's sounds like, it sounds like a, a fascinating show. And, and for folks that do want to check that out, um, where would they go to do that? That's you use your phone. Don't use anything else. You got to use your phone or a tablet and you can go to the app store and download Quibi, Q-U-I-B-I. Uh, there, there's a 90 day free trial, I believe, which is still going on. You can still sign up for it. And there's a lot of shows there. I mean, we're one of the few scripted comedies, but there's daily shows where you can watch daily news updates. There's uh, the will be sports. If we, if we ever have sports again, but like Liam Hemsworth has a show. Sophie Turner has a show like big, big names. There's one right now with Anna Kendrick. That's wonderful called dummy. Um, Reno 911, the show, show from comedy central 10 years ago, rebooted in 10 minute format. So they have so much content that's easily digestible bite-sized little pieces. And right now, normally America loves bite-sized, but right now we all want to, brine our steaks for three days and then smoke them and then spend five days on something. The problem, normally we want tiny bites and now we're, we need big, long, sumptuous meals. Now you're like, now we need like beef Wellington. Or <laughs> yes, Brian. exactly like, right. Like, no, I, I, totally, I totally get it. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me because I'm thinking about it from, let's, let's look at that from like maybe a creative perspective. So okay. how would you compare writing a show where you're doing, you know, seven to 10 minute episodes uh, versus when you're writing um, a movie. You yeah, know? it was it was really unique. It was really unique. And I think that my experience in the past, all my experiences came to head. Like, I think it's a, we did a really good job writing it. And we wrote it very quickly. And it it is because, one, because I was used to cranking out content fast from working in marketing and events. You know, you have to, here, uh, we need it and we need it in six hours. It's like, great, here's your script. But also because I'd had, uh, you know, a long time in sketch comedy, which is all three to five minutes. And then I'd also written movies. So it was almost like, well, here's three different muscles. But if I use them all at the same time, I can crank out a 10 minute episode that all culminates into one movie length piece of content. Um, so it was, it was, it was like a, I played baseball my, my whole life and all of a sudden I picked up golf and I'm like, oh, wait, it's the same moves, just in a different way, you know? That's what it felt like. <laughs> That's an interesting metaphor. Um, okay, so let me ask you this. I asked the same question to, uh, to Maddie Lesham, a friend of the show, okay. uh, and I want to ask you, so if you were to write a screenplay um, on COVID-19 or the plague, as you would call it. Yeah, the um, plague. Just sounds what more dramatic. The, the plague. What What would the main bullet points of that movie be? Um, how will it end? And will we see anything else um, besides a pandemic and murder hornets? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, I'm. I'm a big believer in in science and technology and our capacities as human beings to innovate and find new things. And already we're seeing it. We're seeing, you know, this Herculean effort to find out how to vaccinate, how, you know, therapeutics also, you know, we always, everyone's like, Hey, you know, we we're all waiting on the vaccine. I'm like testing and therapeutics. They're already finding different diseases or, or different uh, uh, pharmaceuticals are helping in different ways, you know? So, Hey, if we can just stop people from dying, that's great. You know, that's a path that listen, you get it, but you're not going to die is a lot better than, yeah, there's listen, there's a chance, which is horrible not to marginalize it, but I believe that we will find a way through this. Also, I feel like this is, you know, we've fallen through a looking glass in a lot of ways, in a good way, I think, that we see kind of the fractures and failures of how we've been operating for a really long time. And hopefully this, this terrible point will get past it but the learnings will stay. You know, that's what I'm, that's what I hope. And I know, I know we are going to get past this. You know, we, he, he, human beings are, are great 
you know, hu humanity is wonderful. We've survived a lot. We keep on picking ourselves up and we'll get through it. We're going to figure out a way. And then on the other side of it, you know, maybe there's going to be more Zoom. Maybe more people are working from home in a good way. L literally, I had to call T-Mobile yesterday and I knew that their entire customer service staff was working from home. And the woman who answered the phone, I'm like, are you working from home? She goes, yes. And I'm like, do you have a dog or a kid around you? She goes, my kid is on my lap right now. And I'm like, I don't know why this feels wonderful, but it's wonderful that you're working and you're with your child right now. It felt great. And I like that 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 would never have been a thought to me before this, but now the idea that someone can be with their child and be able to work and that companies are like, go do that. This is, this is the future feels like a leap. Do you know what I mean? Like the takeaways from this can be so impactful and so meaningful and give us a version of our lives that are, that will be something. And you know, this is a terrible crucible to go through to get there. But I, I think, I hope that that's the end of it. You know, I, I write a, all my movies have a happy ending. Frankly, I, I have a movie right now uh, that's going to be on HBO Max. I feel like I'm shilling now. Am I shilling? It doesn't matter. I'm going to shill. I have a movie coming out on shilling. HBO Max, the new platform that'll be premiering May 24th for HBO. It's actually all of Warner Brothers stuff. And I have a movie that I think will come out on HBO Max in November called Super Intelligence, which is about an artificial intelligence taking over the world and destroying the world, okay? Except stuff happens and there's a happy ending to it because I only write that. And it's, it's funny to see us where we are right now. And there's a lot of doom and gloom, but in my head and in my writing, I know how it's going to end. And it's going to end with, with the best of humanity making the best for humanity. You know, I really like that, Steve. And I <clears throat> personally, I feel the same. Um, I'm someone that tends to always try to see the best in people and the best in humanity because it's a way in, in, in a sense of seeing the best in ourselves because you know we are all essentially universally connected and universally one regardless of whatever a person's spirituality or religion may be um and i think this is absolutely what you're saying is it's shine it's shined a light onto society that hey there's there's more than one ways to do things and while there's, of course, there's a lot of people that are in a, a very bad position because of this, there are a lot of people that have been able to not only carry on, but are, are able to do that in ways that you got, like you, you just mentioned with uh, the person at T-Mobile. You got to think that these companies are going to be looking at them and saying, well, do we need brick and mortar, huge call centers anymore? Are we able to transition the way that we're doing things so that this is actually something that is, is better for us and better for our employees? Um, you know, I feel like, in, in life and if history's taught us anything, sometimes things largely when they get destroyed, they can be built back better. And while I think this has been something for every person on the planet that could not possibly have been foreseeing uh, this, this pandemic coming through and in a period of what, five or six weeks, completely turning the entire globe upside down, um, I think it though out of, I've said this a thousand times on the show is that out of necessity comes reinvention and that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's just, it takes people some time to adjust and to pivot and to start kind of get the grasp on what's where everything's going next. And I think we're starting to see that now um, as people are slowly starting to kind of come back out of this and the, the curve has been flattened a bit to some regards, you know, um, I, I don't think that's, you know, waving the, you know, the floodgates again, just to let's yeah. go back to life bef as it was before. I don't think life is going to go back to the way it was before. I think it's going to be familiar okay. to us. I think they're going to be uh, new, new versions of what normal is. And again, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. All right. My favorite thing to talk about as we, we cl close up here and as we talked a little bit at the beginning of the interview, um, I'd like to ask you then the important question is, What's for dinner tonight? What are you cooking? What do you got going on? I'm not going to kid you, John. I've already made a quiche Lorraine today. <laughs> a quiche Lorraine has already come out of my oven already. That's, that's something that happened already. 
So there'll probably be a uh, cold quiche with a frisé salad. Uh, that will be that will be something, and then I will be uh, brining some uh, bone-in pork chops and apple cider uh, for tomorrow. That will go over. I think I'll, I think I have some mesquite. We'll do them over uh, over mesquite. Oh my goodness, dude, dude! No. Like- I'm just, so your, your wife and your your daughter are they just like do they do they appreciate the culinary masterpieces you're making or is it like oh quiche Lorraine this, again, this point, my, my daughter my daughter literally will look at and i'll be looking at her like does she like it she goes it's great okay it's great everything's been great <laughs> i like i'm expecting her to always tell me what's great uh but uh she doesn't deserve it neither of them deserve it uh, my it's i'm doing more than they deserve that's all <laughs> You know, I think we were, we were, we were chatting a little bit uh, on, on text uh, last week and you mentioned, um, cause you know, we, we haven't seen each other in quite some time yeah. uh, and just recently reconnected uh, and, and, and Grace and your daughter was, uh, was barely just born when I had last yeah. spoken to you. So you said she's 13 now. And then at first I'm like, wow, 13 years have passed. And you also mentioned, you're like, she's at that age where, you know, like, She's just annoyed by her stupid parents yeah. and is now at a position where she's got to be around you guys constantly. And on top of it, you got a homeschooler. So yeah. Yeah. How, how is that all going for you? And is that you or your wife that's, uh, that's the teacher or is it both of you? You know, I'm going to say this, that uh, the school that she goes to, she's on Zoom classes from like nine to two every single day. <laughs> the teachers have been great and my kid is very smart. She's smarter than me. Uh, she's, her grades have gone up somehow, which I don't even know how that is. She, I've had to do very little stuff with her. Like we've, I know a lot of parents have been suffering through this, but she's, she's just one of those good students, something I never was. Um, so she's been, she's been great about it. But literally last night, she came through and was like, this might be the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. I'm like, what? And she goes, this you got here i can't and i'm like yeah that's probably you're probably right and i'm like you're not wrong i would this would suck for me if i was stuck with my parents i'm 13 you know? <laughs> that's just the worst thing that's ever it's happened the worst. i i i'm I, I keep on telling my wife i'm like pretty soon her her eyes are just going to be fixed in that eye roll it's a one perpetual eye right. roll it's a 14 hour eye roll just constantly rolling every time I walk by her. It's wonderful. She's not gonna be able to uh, see she won't be able to see anymore because she'll just be walking into yeah. everything. Oh, no more God. Joke. No more jokes, Dad. No more bits. No more bread. <laughs> Guy. Yeah, that's what I got. Well, Steve, I got to tell you, it has been such a pleasure talking with you again. Um, please know that you're, I'd love to have you back sometime, if, whatever, you, whenever you have time to talk with us. It's been, it's been at my absolute pleasure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Steve Mallory, thank you for coming by. And you can find us, of course, out on the web at www.eventspeak.com. I am Big John, CEO of Beyond Experiential. As always, saying, please take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>